It's hot out there, but let's blow them off the line of scrimmage. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Over the past 14 years, since Al Davis became managing general partner, the Oakland Raiders have compiled the best record in professional football, winning 70% of their games. In the last decade, the Raider record is even more impressive. 108 wins, roughly 11 victories a season, and nine of the last 10 AFC West Division titles. Bud Grant's Minnesota Vikings are second only to the Raiders in winning performance over the last 10 years, having won seven of the previous eight NFC Central Division crowns, and since 1970, no team, not even the Raiders, can match the Viking victory percentage. Yet because neither team has won a Super Bowl, the Vikings and Raiders have unfairly borne the stigma of being called losers by supposed experts despite records that are unmatched in the NFL. Super Bowl XI is only the Raiders' second appearance in the Super Bowl. Failure to get to the game more often has been Oakland's Achilles' heel, while for Minnesota, the game itself has been the Vikings' downfall. They are the Super Bowl's only three-time losers. Today's game is their fourth Super Bowl appearance and third in the last four years. This year's NFL championship game affords the opportunity for one of these teams to shed the unfair and uninformed image of a loser and be recognized as a great team that both teams actually are as the Minnesota Vikings meet the Oakland Raiders in Super Bowl XI. The Raider game plan was to attack the right flank of the Minnesota defense, putting pressure on smallish Jim Marshall, number 70, a 39-year-old defensive end, and number 58, linebacker Wally Hilgenberg, a 13-year veteran. Attacking to their left has always been the Raider forte. Moving out behind all pros Art Shell and Gene Upshaw, number 63. But on their first two thrusts, the Minnesota right side held firm. Though the Vikings won the first and second down skirmishes on third down, Kenny Stabler rolled slightly to his right and picked out tight end Dave Casper for 25 yards to the Minnesota 36-yard line. But the Raiders were not finished with the Vikings' right side. Indeed, they would attack it in critical situations all day. And when Stabler went back for a third try, Clarence Davis popped through for 20 yards. Stabler eventually faced a third and 11 from the Viking 13 and made a surprise call. It was not shocking that Oakland again went left, but despite the down and distance, Stabler called a running play. Again, Minnesota's right flank held fast, forcing a field goal try, which Errol Mann missed when the ball hit the upright. The Vikings had won the first battle, but as the game wore on, the const attack focused on Minnesota's right side would be a telling force. The Viking game plan centered around the running and receiving of number 44, Chuck Foreman, and the passing of Fran Tarkenton. But in the face of Oakland's 3-4 defense, a defense that Minnesota rarely sees, it was no contest as the Raider defense completely muffled the Viking attack. Tarkenton tried every means imaginable to get the ball to his versatile running back, but nothing seemed to work as Foreman could gain just 26 yards rushing in the first half, and he had to work hard for that. In an effort to get the ball to Foreman on passes, Tarkenton even tried faking a run to Foreman, rolling one way and throwing back the other, anything to get the ball to Foreman. As a receiver, Foreman was somewhat more successful, but this pass for 26 yards came on the last play of the half and was to be Tarkenton's longest completion of the day. This play reveals why the Vikings want Foreman to handle the ball so much. 
But in Super Bowl XI, the Raiders never let Foreman or sensational rookie Sammy White, number 85, fight off the long one that had keyed so many Viking victories this season. Tarkenton had a simply awful first half, completing just five passes, only one to an outside receiver that gained just seven yards, as Tarkenton and his receivers helped stifle themselves. White was open here, but Tarkenton took too long getting the ball to him, allowing the Raiders to recover. Raider coverage in the secondary, of course, was the main problem for Tarkenton, but even when he laid a beauty into Ahmad Rashad, the usually meticulous wide receiver dropped the ball, costing Minnesota a big game. Had it not been for the early heroics of the Viking defense, the game could well have been out of control by halftime. They had stopped the Raiders' first drive, and when Stabler completed a nine-yard pass to Fred Bolitnikoff, the Raiders seemed on the go again. But two great plays by number 50, middle linebacker Jeff Seaman, would force the Raiders to punt. When Oakland was forced to punt a short time later, the Minnesota special teams performed their specialty. In the conference championship game, a block kick that bounced right to number 20, Bobby Bryant, had helped put Minnesota in the Super Bowl. But this time, Bryant could not duplicate the feat, a fact that, as we shall later see, was to haunt the Vikings. Still, the Vikings special teams had turned in another big play, and isolating Fred McNeil, the kick spiker, we can see that no one touched him. And the Vikings had their 16th blocked kick of the year, and the chase was on. The Vikings gained possession on the three-yard line. As they have so often done in the past when their offense is sputtering, defense and special teams get Minnesota started. And it appeared that they had done it again. Ray Guy had never before had a kick block, but he kept his wits about him and was credited with a touchdown saving tackle, one that was to be crucial. For two plays later, Brent McClanahan fumbled and the course of Super Bowl XI was forever altered. <laughs> Willie Hall's recovery saved the Raiders a score, but mired close to their own end zone, Oakland was still in a bind. With a third and seven from their own six, Oakland attacked left one more time. And when they needed it most, Clarence Davis chugged 35 yards, taking the Raiders out of a big hole. With much more operating room, Stabler was able to open up and a 25-yard shot to Casper on which the big tight end broke several tackles had Oakland on the Minnesota 23. Four runs brought the ball to the seven. The Raiders had now driven 91 yards and just missed the last seven when Casper could not come down in the end zone. From the 24, Warren Bankston made sure number 25, Nate Allen, the Vikings' premier placement blocker, got nowhere near the ball, and Oakland had a three to nothing lead. Once again, the Viking defense, that many experts call the toughest to score on from inside the five, had held, but the Purple Gang had been on the field for 30 plays with only 11 plays to rest, and the imbalance finally caught up with them. After another four-play respite, they were back on the field with legs and arms wearying. Their tackling began to suffer, and Carl Garrett's great effort had Oakland going goalward once more.
From the one Oakland used a play that never seems to fail, no matter how many times they use it. Stabler play fakes a run, and Dave Casper never has anyone within five yards of him. Oakland 10, Minnesota nothing. While Casper and Cliff Branch catch many of Stabler's touchdown passes, it is often Fred Bolitnikoff that sets them up with precise moves and gooey hands. Prior to Casper's touchdown, Bolitnikoff hauled in a third and three pass, but was knocked out one yard from the score. On the next play, Casper got it. On the Raiders' next series, Stabler went to Bolitnikoff again, and his diving catch set up another Oakland touchdown, this time from the six-inch line. Bolitnikoff would be the first to thank Stabler for the completion, however. He made a fine catch on what may seem like a low throw. But had Stabler put it higher, Jeff Wright might have taken Bolitnikoff's head off. This Bolitnikoff classic was his second touchdown spurring catch. For one play later, Pete Banaszak scored, putting Oakland ahead 16 to nothing at halftime of Super Bowl XI. With his team safely ahead by 16, Oakland's John Madden watched with some interest as the Vikings tried desperately to generate some offense on the first series of the third quarter. A reverse to Sammy White that could gain only seven yards pretty accurately summed up the Vikings' plight, for this was a play designed to break for a long game. Obviously, nothing had changed from the first half. Clarence Davis was running again at will, and with five minutes to lapse in the new quarter, Errol Mann booted the ball through the uprights for a 40-yard field goal that increased Oakland's lead to 19 to nothing. The Raiders, it seemed, had absolutely nothing to worry about. Super Bowl XI was well under control. But here, the Raiders' special teams made their second mistake of the day, and like the first, it came on a punt. Number 83, Ted Hendricks, in his haste to make good a pregame boast that he would block a kick, ran into Neil Claybo and gave the Vikings a first down and another chance. This time, Fran Tarkenton took advantage of the opportunity. Ahmad Rashad made his first big catch of the day, good for 21 yards to the Oakland 25. Then four plays later on fourth and three, Tarkenton hit a pressure pass. A swing to Foreman who took a 10 yards for a first down on the Silver and Blacks eight yard line. All of a sudden, Tarkenton made it look easy as he found the touch with a pass to Sammy White for the Vikes' first score of the day. Another look shows it was indeed easy. White had perfect position on his defender for the touchdown. If ever Minnesota was to make its mark, now was the time, and every man on the Vikings' once famed defense was aware of it. Appropriately, all pro Allen Page rose to the challenge and sacked Stabler on the Raiders' first play from scrimmage following the score. Oakland was forced to punt, and once more, Tarkenton had his team moving on the forward pass.
After Tarkenton's most authoritative pass of the day, Sammy White took a head tackle at the end of this reception, but it was nothing compared to what was coming from Messrs. Tatum, Atkinson, and Thomas a few plays later. Incredibly, the NFC Rookie of the Year held onto the ball despite a shot heard round the Rose Bowl. Another look shows Thomas coming over fast and giving the two punch to back up Tatum's initial blow. Note the concentration on White's face. White caught the ball, but it's doubtful he knew it at the time or would remember it later. One thing for sure, the 104,000 at the Rose Bowl would not forget it. Shattering as the tackle was, it was nothing compared to the next play, one which all agreed was the true turning point of Super Bowl XI. The man who made it was number 39, Willie Hall, an unlikely hero. With the Viking passing game finally in high gear, Tarkenton was pressured, scrambled, and threw off balance. The result was disaster for Minnesota. Willie Hall was the man on the spot, and his interception ended the genuine Viking scoring threat that would have brought the Norsemen within reach. Another look shows it was Ted Hendricks, number 83, that pressured Tarkenton into his foolhardy error. a man who had been cut by Oakland and who in fact was driving a truck when the Raiders preseason began had made perhaps the key play of the 11th Super Bowl. Oakland is a team that never wastes an opportunity to take advantage of a turnover. They go for the jugular and Stabler and Bolitnikoff applied the knockout punch. After Sticky Fred's lonely 48-yard foray, Pete Banaszak did the honors from the two. Banaszak, Bolitnikoff, Willie Brown, and Gene Upshaw are the only Raiders left from the team that lost Super Bowl II. With the score 26-7, their enthusiasm was understandable. If there was any doubt in anyone's mind about the outcome of this game, it was settled on the next series of downs. Though Tarkenton drove his team downfield again, his receivers were not getting the best of things. Then with first and 10 on the Raider 28, Tarkenton tried a quick sideline pass that had little on it. And it, in effect, ended the Super Bowl game. <laughs> 75 yards later, 14-year veteran cornerback Willie Brown had a touchdown that broke the Vikings back in the game wide open. There could be no doubt who the winner was now.
Though Minnesota would eventually score another touchdown, it mattered little. The Oakland Raiders had erased all doubts. They were the finest team in professional football. They did it by beating a good Minnesota team with surprising ease. In fact, Raider coach John Madden was candid enough to suggest that Oakland had a tougher time getting to Super Bowl XI than they did in winning it. Certainly through 13 regular season victories and big wins over Pittsburgh and New England in the playoffs, the Raiders beat the best. And now as the sun began to sink over the San Gabriel Mountains in Pasadena, California, John Madden and his silver and black crew had dramatically and emphatically earned the title as the world champions of professional football.